Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 16, Build Automation. Take it away, Jason. Hey, so uh, I've been working on a crazy hobby project that finally sort of culminated to a terminus. Is that is that redundant to say crazy hobby project? Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> All my hobby point. projects are very crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one didn't like crash or explode or anything, which is oh, kind of okay, nice. Good, good, good. That's, a, that's a plus. And you finished? Yes, that's right. I did. That's an so, accomplishment. I guess I finished most of it. I have a little bit more to do, but yeah, there's art is more never to do. truly finished. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it's called Trivipedia, and so the idea is, you know, I only recently found out that you could download all of Wikipedia, like the entire text corpus of Wikipedia, in one zip. If you're a glutton for punishment or want to break your bandwidth caps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like an eight, nine gig zip or something. Oh, it's not that bad. And then even better, you can download what's called the squid logs. And for people who don't know, um, squid is like a proxy um, for like, you know, s- sending messages to different servers and caching and things like that. But long story short is you could download for all of the Wikipedia pages how many hits they received. Like oh. the page view count. Popularity contest. Yeah, exactly. So I took the most popular Wikipedia pages. What was the most popular page? So the, the most popular page is Facebook, which oh. is hilarious. Yeah, I think that... Well, this is still recent to the IPO, so... This was, yeah, 2011 data. So okay. I think that, uh. like, maybe people are, like, you know... Because I noticed that Facebook's Wikipedia page is the second search result for Facebook. Oh, So, yeah, I okay. think a lot of people okay. are sort of fat-fingering it or something. Maybe. Um... Yeah, and also a lot of, uh, uh, and we're keeping the podcast clean here, but, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, certain movie stars were, were oh. incredibly popular on Wikipedia. Was, they pretty much dominated the top 100. Oh. And I was kind of surprised because I know that's how the regular internet is is distributed, but, like, I didn't really realize that. <laughs> that's, that's sad. Even on Wikipedia, it's the most popular thing. So, so what is what is Trivipedia? So, yeah, Trivipedia, you can go to www.trivipedia.net. Oh, you should probably spell that. Yeah, T-R-I-V-I-P-E-D-I-A. Okay. Dot net. And uh, essentially, I curated about 300,000 trivia questions from all this Wikipedia data for the most popular sites. So, you know, you'll get a question like, this person is like a young singer, blah, 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 born this year. And your choices might be like Justin Bieber or Justin Timberlake or something, right? And you'd have to like click I, on the I'm going to do answer. terrible at this game. <laughs> yeah. There's many different categories. just like a side tech category and stuff. So. Yay! Yeah, it's pretty fun. Um, there's also an Android app and um, just finishing the touches on an iPhone app. So Maybe we'll hear more about that later. Yeah, totally. The iPhone app is going to use our tool of the bye week. Oh, Total teasers. Spoiler. Teasers, teasers. <laughs> Coming up. So, uh, so yeah, and maybe, you know, if I have uh, $150,000 sitting in my back pocket, I can make a TL top-level domain for Trivipedia. Oh, Trivipedia. yeah. So I did want to say that I checked out Trivipedia. It is pretty cool, and I like that you can uh, kind of be uh, the... Trivia uh, oh, crown yeah, champion of your area. Yeah, that's right. He uses the location. So, you know, in the beginning, you could be like, you know, Trivia Knight of, of Santa Clara County or Knight Yay! of Orange County. And uh, as you move your rating up, you can end up being, you know, there's somebody who can. I, I want to be king of like the Bieber questions. <laughs> We're like study about yeah. Bieber now just to like. No, king I won't. Bieber. That's a lie. That's a lie. <laughs> Oh, but yeah, that. I think most countries now have a king or queen, which means there's at least one person. Oh, wow. Well, that's that a kind country. of an accomplishment. That's cool to see your yeah. work be used around the world. Yeah, yeah. The, right now, the emperor of Trivipedia, so the person with the highest rating in the world, is an American. But uh, that's only recently. So it used to be a British uh, guy. So ah. there's a little contention a, there. A British emperor. Well, that should be emperor. king. And, uh, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? All right. So, so like you were saying, so when you earn one hundred and fifty thousand dollars from this, yeah, I can buy, I can buy Trivipedia dot Trivipedia. Whoa! My <laughs> yeah. mind exploded. So, so, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. So, uh, still recently, um, we had a you know a few articles talking about all the different top level domains that were 
sold or being sold or what we're being bid on, I guess they're going to go through an approval process. Yep. And so top level domain is a thing that comes at the end of a URL before the slashes specific to the website. So like .com, .edu, .org, like these are the common ones. And then countries have their own, so like .ly yep. you know, or .co. So some of these are, are more popular than others, but yeah, there's not, there's a, you know, a numerable amount. There's not too many. Yeah, and, totally. uh, and they usually represent something very specific. Like, you know, each country has its own, and then there's EDU for university. But it's right. not like, up until now, it's not like you can just have anything. Right, but now I guess, say, well, why? Like, why can't we just have anything, you know? And so they're allowing companies to, if they can, there's like certain requirements. So it has to be something that's, you know, going to be useful generally. And that also, I guess, they have to support, like, other people being able to have, like, subdomains and be yep. essentially their own registrar to allow people to register. Although it wasn't clear to me that they have to allow open registrations or how much they're allowed to charge or what restrictions they can put on it. Yep. Um, but so a number of companies, Google, Amazon, and others, um, so it's fairly expensive, like $150,000 to get one of these, but they reserve some kind of crazy ones like LOL or yep. .blog or, you know, of course, Google, like got Google.google or so you could do search.google, you know, I yep. assume things like this or Amazon, you know, buy.amazon or shop.amazon. Yep. Mobile.amazon. Yeah, so, and, and that's kind of good. Like it seems like another layer of security. Like I know I'm going to, like if it's something dot Amazon, like I know it's the Amazon p page versus yeah, like exactly. is Amazon dot net really Amazon? Like I don't know. Yep. Um, but maybe it's also confusing too because now like it's not obvious that if you want to guess a company's thing, you can't just add dot com after the end of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, it used to be you know with so few choices, each choice used to have sort of a intuition behind it. But now that there's going to be just so many choices. Like you might have dot Amazon without the O. Like these kind of things might start coming mm, out. Yeah, that's right. Make it shorter. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know. One of those things you know you hear about when people talk about creativity or art or that kind of thing is that it's uh, those restrictions, the the limits, working in bounds. Like that makes people very creative. So you end up with these like people ending like I remember delicious was you know what d e l dot i c i o dot u s. It's like yeah. impossible to remember, <laughs> but like the, it was cool because like they use dot u s to like spell it delicious or yep. you know like URL short notes like bitly dot ly like these yep. I mean they have ringy names and they're using it's like you get this creativity but yeah if you can have anything like you know I, I guess there will still be creativity but it's kind of different because the the domain is so much wider open yeah yeah exactly so some people who missed out on investment and name squatting in the last uh, round of top level domains being open are now saying this is a huge investment opportunity. What do you thought? Should should you go invest some money uh, and uh, so not buying a top level domain, but once the domains start opening up, should you go try to register as many as you can on various? Uh, oh, I see. On various top levels. So yeah, it's, so before there was, how many top levels do you think there were before? Maybe a know. thousand. No, I, no, I don't think. Not I was even like in the thousand. hundreds. Yeah. yeah, but now I mean, there's effectively infinite, right? Because you can have any as long as you have 150k and you're willing to, you know, construct a tiny bit of infrastructure you need to give domain subdomains to other people you can have just about anything so i don't know i think that there might be like a land grab in the beginning but i feel like it once people realize like the gigantic space of names that are possible that uh yeah it's not going to be a very good investment so yeah I, it's hard to it. say because it's always a, a strain to say this time is different, right? Like, yeah. oh, there's more, so this time will be different than last time. Well, maybe it won't be. Maybe it will be. Like, you can't know until afterwards. Yeah, it's true. There's some blackmail opportunities. Like, somebody registered, I think, sucks, dot sucks. Oh. So, like, now every company is going to want to, you know, have, like, Amazon dot sucks so that they can control it and not you and say oh, bad things man. about them. That's a great so it's about, idea. But, but then with, to your point, with so many, you, what about, like, is horrible? Or yeah, you know, that's true. or that's vulgarities, true. or right. I mean, any sort of like thing after then. Like, why does it have to be like? If you wanted Jason dot is awesome, or what about Jason is super, or yeah, Jason exactly. is fantastic? Like, the land grab seems different to me. Like, you could always find seems like something that would work. Yeah, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, there's there's so many like permutations of just sucks or awesome. Like, there's so many other ways you can say that, right? And they're all available, so. Yeah, so if you were gonna create an app, like let's say Trivipedia, and you wanted to have it be freemium, what, what top level domain would you choose to, uh, to ensure a good success? <laughs> or do we know anything about that? I think we do know a little bit about the anatomy of freemium from this article, The Anatomy of Profitable Freemium. It's, uh, it's, I thought it was extremely interesting. You know, freemium is sort of the future of a lot of things. You know, games are becoming more and more freemium. Um, 
you know, there's some games like, for example, Diablo 3, where although they did charge for the game, there's a marketplace where you can buy and sell items that you've, um, that you've like, grinded for in the game for real money. Um, and uh, the way it works is Blizzard gets a cut of that. And so, you know, if that that's proven to be a huge money maker, I think, from, from articles I've read. And so they, most likely, when Diablo 4 comes out, they won't even charge for it because they'll just have this marketplace mechanic. So a lot of apps are going to the freemium model. It has obvious benefits, right? Because it completely removes the barrier of entry. Like, it, let's say you think you have no faith in this company and you know you don't know if this is going to be a quality game you have no history no track record it has no metacritic but it's free you at least give it a shot you'd say let me you know make a character and just you know even if i got through the character making screen and left i had nothing to lose right yeah i i see what they're saying so i have played a number of free to play games or whatever but mm -hmm. i have less investment like almost it's more of a waste of time because you well, it's a different experience so you're going game to game like I spend very little time in any one game because I have no commitment to it I right. don't pay anything so I download it I play it for an hour or two or a day and I never really get into it it's like oh this control scheme is not amazing or whatever like I never put investment into learning it or playing it well and I just skip to the next one yeah. and then just skip to the next one so like I'm still taking up my time but in some ways like I feel like I would be more enjoyable paying for something because then I feel like it's sunk cost and like I need to play it because and then you'll you could be forced into enjoying something that at first seemed not good. Like, the, you know, you read books or watch movies where, like, if you could leave at any time and there was no kind of barrier to entry of having bought it or rented it or gone to the movie theater, like, after the first five or ten minutes, you might have just walked walked away or flipped the channel or whatever. But because you, like, you stick through it, and then it turns out, like, the movie is really amazing, and it's just, like, you needed to get through those first few minutes to accomplish what the director wanted. So yeah, like, that's a good point. I mean, if, if, if it is freemium, then you really have to impress people like from the first few hours of gameplay, I guess. But but then doesn't it come down to like tricking people? Like you, you show like all your features up front and like, oh, you're going to get much more amazing features if you pay. But then like it turns out like, oh, actually, this isn't that much more amazing. Yeah, yeah. There is a lot of that. I mean, a lot of these games, like for example, I was playing one called uh, Dungeon Fighter Online. And... Uh, you pay money to get, I guess, more storage in your backpack. But like that just made the game like more cumbersome because a lot of the things that you hold you don't even need. So you could just you're like actually better, more agile. You're just it's hoarding like, stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. It sort of appeals to your hoarding mechanic, but at the expense of like actually being better at the game. So yeah, I mean it's one of these things that you really sort of have to get right. And and nobody there's no formula, there's no science yet. Um, and so this is one of the few articles I was able to come across where they actually sort of try to put a science on it and explain like these are some models, these are some you know companies that have done well with it, some companies that have done poor. One thing that was sort of like a motif across the entire um, article was that there's a small, small subset of the population which they call whales <laughs> who subsidize the no the comment game to their actual physical size. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there, these few whales. So, so f let's say you know 900 people or 990 people will play and not pay a dime, but then 10 people will pay like a thousand dollars or like mm. hundreds of dollars each. And they'll basically subsidize the game for everybody else. Yeah. And uh, that and that's true for games, and it's also true for um, programs like Dropbox and Evernote and things like that. So across the board, that's been one um, common observation. And I thought that was really interesting. That is interesting. I, I mean, I think there's a balance. Like, if you like a service, you kind of should pay for it because mm -hmm. otherwise, you can't complain if it goes away. You weren't paying anything for it. Like, it's annoying. We've all had favorite web services or sites that go away because the author just didn't have time because they weren't making like Trivipedia. If you don't make a lot of money off of that, your incentive to keep it maintained is, is lower. Like no offense, but you know, <laughs> no. Even, but if it's hugely successful, like you're gonna, you know, and people are able to contribute money or yep. generate revenue for you in other ways, you're much more likely to stick with it. I mean, even like look at the inspiration of Trivipedia. Wikipedia itself is constantly in need of money, and and uh, they're constantly sort of like on the edge because they have such high bandwidth expenses. Yeah. And things like Maybe that. you couldn't monetize it though. I, it's it's a fine balance to walk. Yeah, yeah. Freemium is uh, sorry. Wikipedia is donationware, which is has its own set of interesting mechanics and everything. I have a feeling that. You know, when kids grow up, they're going to think that was it Jimmy Wales uh -huh. that he is like everything because because you'll search for say like George Washington <laughs> his personal plea and you see like yeah his personal plea is the very first thing so it's like uh -huh. 
I have a wonder if you went to like a five year old and you said, Who's George Washington? And you had a picture of him and Jimmy, Jimmy Wales. Wales. Oh, no. <laughs> It'll be like the McDonald's arch as like most recognizable face. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if you're if you're trying out all these uh, freemium apps and you gotta generate an account and create a password and yep. you know what's to say that your password's not gonna get leaked? Like uh, our next news story where LinkedIn Yeah, leaked LinkedIn a bunch of totally things. busted, right? So and uh, yeah, I have like a personal gripe about this because you know I was one of the people whose passwords were leaked. I got the email from LinkedIn when I logged in. They told me to change my password, etc. Um, fortunately, I use a like we use KeePass, which is actually something I think it was a that was tool a tool of the, of the week. Yeah, week. Yeah. yeah, so um, uh, so my password that password was just a throwaway. But uh, in the past year, my LinkedIn, my Joystick forum password, and uh, my Twitter password have all been leaked. And uh, in fact, Twitter, they were able to, I think we talked about this on our show, but someone went into my Twitter um, and my Facebook, which they both shared the same KeePass password. I don't, oh. I don't know how that happened. But <laughs> I think I, there's some it, reason. There's a one in a uh, billion chance, so you just <laughs> yeah, got right. unlucky. Pretty sure there was some laziness going on there. But uh, so the, yeah, all these passwords got leaked and someone went in and posted as me and it was not pretty. But uh, I had to clean all that up. So, you know, I personally am like, this is really upsetting because I use KeePass. I try and keep everything secure and these passwords are constantly getting leaked out. And um, But at the same time, I can understand them wanting to have an identity. You know, if you use like login with Google or something, then you sort of dilute your brand. You know, like like LinkedIn, like, like Facebook's not going to have a login with Google account and vice uh, versa, right. you know. So I can see sort of both sides of it. I can see, you know, businesses wanting to have like their own identity of you, but then I can also see how like a lot of people aren't taking security seriously. Uh, a lot of uh, apps on like on the iPhone and iPad and stuff, I, I, I know more about that than Android, but they seem to offer, well, those in some websites now offer both, like create your own account with that company mm -hmm. or use like login with Facebook yeah, or log yeah, with Twitter, which like I actually Stack like that. Overflow does that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. I actually feel like that might be the best of both worlds. Like, yep. hey, if you're too lazy, like do this. But if you, you know, if you want to just create an account, because the problem is like some stuff is like only with Facebook because they want to spam your board or whatever. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But bother your friends. And yeah, it's so, like that's annoying. So like you might want to create your own account. Um, and then also if you don't have Facebook, you know, like I don't, I don't have a Facebook account. Like I think I do somewhere, but I, I don't ever, ever, ever use it. And mm -hmm. so I don't, I wouldn't even know what the login is for it anymore. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I would just probably ignore the website. So it's nice yeah, when they have an option yeah. to create your own and, you know, I can just generate something random and use and try it out or whatever. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. But yeah, these passwords got leaked. They've used LinkedIn. Um, supposedly, they said although the passwords got leaked, no one's account was compromised because they know which passwords were leaked. Uh. And so they just locked down those accounts. And so if you I got the email I did, um, the next time you go into LinkedIn, it'll just have you change your password. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah, nice. Yeah. You know, that's something that I think companies are doing a better job. Security is still a big issue, but being upfront, like, hey, something happened to us. And yeah, so, like, true. hey, like, let's just reset everybody or, you know, let's let everybody know. Like, I feel like they're being much more responsible about about that for the most part. Yeah. I'm sure there's exceptions we don't hear about. <laughs> yeah, totally. But, yeah. So, if you wanted to, like, learn about security, you know, you might go and try to get, like, a master's degree, but that's pretty expensive. So, somebody should do something to, like, offer a master's degree for, like, maybe, like, $100. Man, $100? You mean $100,000? No, $100. $100. That's what our next news article talks about. Sebastian Thrun, like, a crazy guy who I, I keep seeing pop up around the internet. And yep. he's, like, a, he was, like, a Stanford professor. He's, like, running his own li online college now. Yep. And, like, he also, I think he even works at Google. Like, yep. I don't don't know how one person has enough time to do all of those things um, but he in an interview was talking about that you know he wants to revolutionize online education which I agree I, I yeah, was talking to somebody totally. about saving so I have a young child you know my daughter's you know be many years before she goes to college and so one thing you begin to think about is like should I start saving for you know college because although it's many years away the earlier you start the easier it is yeah. um, but uh, you know, I don't even know like I do and I probably will but I, I don't know that education will be the same for my daughter that, that we went through. Yeah, like, I think that, you know, the you know, as we move to online and things like that, the number of students that a teacher can teach grows dramatically and I think the bubble on education might burst, you know. So. Well not just like the ability for a teacher to teach so many more people, but the best teachers can teach the people. 
Uh, I mean, I, I had a lot of te- I, I went to a great college, but I had a lot of teachers who, uh, yeah, same you here. know, and so if you could get the best teacher and then this sounds really bad, but, you know, just like other people, right, like those teachers or whatever become kind of teaching assistants. So because there are so many students, they have the same size class, but somebody else is doing the lecturing and they're really there one on one helping people going through the concepts in fine detail. Like I think in general, that could probably be a better model. Yeah, totally. totally. So, so Sebastian is trying to he is currently he ran a CS 101 where you built your own search engine, which oh, I nice. actually kind of wanted to do have to check that like out. just to that do it. Awesome. And then he did introduction to A.I., which, of oh, okay. course, Stanford also had one, but he yep. did one, which was uh, learning to drive or learning to program self-driving car. Oh, nice. So I don't know if that comes from his Google work or not. Now, are these classes that anyone can just go to and, and, and participate Yeah, so I don't in? think there's any cost, so it's completely free. You go, you take the class, they have tests, they have homework. Like, that's a pretty big commitment. I've done a couple, and I've never successfully oh, really? finished them because I, <laughs> okay. I just can't bring myself to do homework, and I haven't paid anything you to You have, risk. like, three <laughs> virtual Fs. <laughs> no, I have way more than three virtual Fs. It's horrible. Um <laughs> But yeah, so anyone can register. I mean, there, it lists like what are good prerequisites. So like if you're going to do CS, like it's certain math and statistics right. you probably need to be able to be successful. Um, you probably pick it up if you're really dedicated to it. But And you could totally go at your own pace. So let's yeah. say you take the class and it turns out, oh, I don't, you know, I don't have what it takes to take this class. You could take another class. Like you could take algebra from iTunes U. There's a hundred universities that have that online. And then go back, you know, with, with your new knowledge. and, and Yeah, and try again. And try. Yeah. So he's trying to do a world record setting. I forget how many, I think, I believe it's in the hundreds of thousands. Um, I don't have the article up in front of me, but hundred, hundreds of thousands of people he needs. And he's going to do an introduction to statistics course. Oh, and okay. he wants to set the record for most people in an online course. Um, and so this is, this is pretty good. I encourage you if you're interested in statistics. Statistics is something that I think in modern society that everybody has to have. You hear statistics thrown yeah. at you constantly to be able to do like expected value, to be able to do, you know, these kinds of things. You don't need to be able to do Bayesian inference or like crazy like complex. All that stuff is really cool and very useful. Yep. But like as a person in a modern high tech society, the amount of things that if you knew statistics would help you clarify or think through or make rash attempt to make rational decisions totally. is very important. It's very yeah. important to know statistics. Yeah, I mean, even just like basic causal analysis, you know, like, like you know, everyone's heard the cliche, if you flip a penny three times and you get heads all three times, what's the chance you're gonna get heads the fourth time? Of course, it's 50-50 because, you know, those there's no de- interdependencies. Just because you got heads the first three times doesn't mean anything about the fourth flip, right? And there's a lot more than just that simple rule in statistics, which will really sort of give you good intuitions mm-hmm. to make smart decisions. And then the subtlety to that, right? Like if you flip a head four times in a row, that fourth time is a head now, like, you know, over the next, you know, in flips, it will revert to the mean. Right. So you chances are you will have less tails and head, but still any one flip is the same. So it's all yeah. this crazy stuff or or one always gets me, which I like, and they're kind of enjoyable logic puzzles is uh, if a if somebody has two kids, and you know that one of them is a boy, what's the chance that the other one is a girl? If somebody has two kids and you know one of them is a boy, what's the chance that the other is a girl? I feel uh, like we, I'm walking we, into we a might, say, yeah, yeah. but I, I'm pretty sure it's 50-50, right? Uh, so it actually turns out it's not, it's get con- really? it gets confusing. So let me see if I can do this correct. Maybe I'll be wrong. Right. Uh, so I believe that, so the reason why is because either one can be a boy. So the chance of the other one being a boy means that both have to be boys which is a one in four chance. So the chance okay. of another one being a girl oh, is the other of that. So it's saying. a 75% chance that the other one is a girl. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So it's because the I didn't tell you the first one is a boy. Yeah, yeah. What's the second one? Of them either of them is a boy. So then what? Uh, so I told you only yeah. one, and I didn't tell you the position. Nice. I think that's right. I, I might. Somebody's no, going to email us and tell us I'm that wrong. That sounds but. totally legit. So, so okay, anyways. If you want to trick your friends with logic puzzles, <laughs> Um, and, and maybe you could read about those statistics courses on your new Microsoft Surface tablet. Yeah, yeah. Maybe there's an app for that. Oh, wait. <laughs> You're giving that's away what our thoughts are about yeah, it. Yeah, at this point, that's a double spoiler. But yeah, basically, the uh, Microsoft Surface tablet was announced. And I think you know more about this than me. Oh, I, well, I, so I got trapped into one of my friends is like, uh, oh, are you going to watch it? I'm like, oh, OK, all right. Uh, I guess I'll watch the live announcement. And uh, this is, I, I think it was earlier this last week, um, we got messed up technical difficulties. So we're redoing some of these news stories. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we're never particularly on top of the ball as far as getting <laughs> our uh, getting our news stories very uh, 
timely, but that's okay because we like to talk about the broader concepts. Yeah, exactly. And you can find all of the links online in our show notes. Totally. But uh, Microsoft had this live announcement, like we're going to talk about this stuff. And then as soon as I saw what it was, I'm just like, oh, fail. It's so like we've made something that's like more than a tablet. It's got this keyboard and a kickstand, and those are all really amazing things. But, you know, it's part of the allure of a tablet in my use is, like, it's simplicity. You do one thing at a time. It's very simple. If I want to do anything more, I'm going to get on my computer. Yep. But I want my tablet to be simple and awesome and really good at what it does and, you know, be easy to use. And I can use it late at night when I don't want to have to do a thousand things and it has good battery life. And every time you try to make it do something a little bit more, you're, you're sacrificing something else. Yeah, you know, either totally. cost, battery life, like something. I mean, you can't get them all. And then the fact that, you know, they're going to have like a lower end tablet, which the pricing's not quite out yet. And then a higher end tablet is going to be essentially a laptop. And it's just like, they're going to have a full process. And like, how hot is this thing going to get? What's the battery life going to be? You know, and then, yeah, it's amazing. They showed it running uh, Lightroom, which is a photo editing app. It'd be amazing to be able to run Lightroom on my tablet. But, you know, if it's going to have to do all these other things and the battery life's going to be horrible and it's going to be very expensive and... Yeah, I mean, wasn't the claim that it can run any Windows app or something like I, that? I think that was one of the claims of the more advanced ones, like the no, Pro okay. model or whatever. But I so, I mean, don't want my... open Pandora's box, <laughs> yes. right? Yes, I mean, because now they have to support, like, you know, all sorts of quirks from previous Windows versions yeah. and crazy things. I mean, and... I noticed, like, even switching between my phone and, the, and I have a Motorola Zoom tablet, you know, the apps, will, like, the compatibility varies wildly. Like, an app that will work fine on the phone will just completely bomb on the tablet. And and it, it, it's not just the obvious things, like the screen display being shifted, although that happens a lot. A lot of apps, like, you know, you go to touch and there's some weird shifting going on because they weren't expecting the screen size of the tablet. But, but even just more subtle things, like certain processes will just crash. Like there is this uh, thing called Open Faint, which is a way okay. to like it's save like a your score high the scoreboard cloud. thing. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So like any game that had that would crash on my oh. screen. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it has nothing to do really with the display or anything. Yeah, so the iPhone one's not as bad. The iOS does. It's pretty good. Like I haven't had yeah, a lot of issues with that. iPhone's good about that. But um, yeah, I mean just the Windows thing. Like I mean, I, oh, it'd be so cool. I could run Quick 2 on my, you know, yeah, on my tablet. Yeah, I'm sure that'll be But the... it's like, ah, uh, but what is the experience going to be like? Like, in reality, although it's cool to do that, people need to have the tablet experience in mind. Like, you right. want somebody to d- sat down and designed it. The more you try to make it do and the less custom tailored it is, like, the, the less enjoyable it is to some extent. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you know what would be awesome is if they had it run the iOS simulator and then <laughs> oh. you could download iOS apps. <laughs> yeah, awesome. That's a word for it. So, but they, another cool thing, they have the cover that has a keyboard on it. And that I thought cool. that was, that's pretty that's cool. Fair. But, you know, I, I mean, anybody could do, like, it's not like amazing leap forward. I feel like it's a yep. me too, me too, you know. Yep. And then it has a kickstand. Ooh. On the back, you can flip out the little stand and it stands up. Yeah, and it's just no like, one's oh. done that before. Like, I, I much prefer having it without the stand be a little thinner, and then I'll just get a $10 aftermarket stand that is exactly the stand I want for my use case, you know? Yep. So, yep. Uh, oh but well. But this one comes in hot pink. Whoa! No, 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 no. You didn't tell me. Hot pink? <laughs> I'm totally buying one now. Oh, man, I gotta get it. Okay, well, anyways. Um, I think it's time for our... I don't have a good transition. I was doing so good, but tool, tool of, of the, the bye week. week. That's right. We made up for it by both saying that yeah. at the same time. It's awesome. So um, my tool of the bye week is um, Apache Cordova, which used to be called PhoneGap. And this thing is pretty awesome. Basically, the way it works is, you know, right now, if you want to make an app for the phone, as I as I did with Trivipedia, you know, you either have to write a separate app for every type of phone. So in other words, you have to, you know, bust out your Java skills and write like the Android app in Java. Then you have to go to, you know, the um, iPhone and write like an Objective C app. And then you have to go to the Windows Mobile and I don't even that know. That sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, that's painful, right? Incredibly painful. So um, fortunately, um, all of the phones support JavaScript. So actually you can write JavaScript code for the iPhone. And for the um, for Android, I think it pops up like a web view and launches your JavaScript, but it, it feels like a natural app. So you can actually, you know, if you did it right, you can write your code in JavaScript and it would work across all these devices, oh. assuming you had kind of the right middleware layer. And that's what PhoneGap is. 
So PhoneGap, it, you take your, like, uh, you write HTML and JavaScript as if you're making a website. And then what PhoneGap does is it converts your, like, website buttons and your website pull down menus and stuff into the native controls. So, like, you know, if you were to say, like, um, click a link in a website and it takes you to a new page and then you have like the browser bar at the top and that's not really the experience you want when you're making like a native phone app, right? No. This sort of obfuscates all of that. So, you know, it gets rid of the browser bar, it makes the URLs go to like, um, not really go to real pages, but they sort of compact all the pages into like the application, so it feels ah. very smooth and quick. There's no loading screens or anything. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's storing locally all the pages. Yeah, exactly. Um. It sort of like does this compilation process, and uh, it's great. You know, I had it. Um, I tested it on. You know, I made the Android app for Triva PG already, so um, I didn't need to use PhoneGap for that. Um, but I, but I did anyways. I built an Android version, and it ran pretty well. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, and I built the... Uh, I mainly used it for the iPhone version, and it went really well. So pretty happy with the performance. So we're going to see you on the App Store soon? I hope so, yeah. I'm actually I'm on the Android App Store already with the native Android app. Um, the should be on the iPhone App Store pretty soon. I have to you know, save up for that hundred dollar <laughs> developers fees they want to smack me with. Okay. It's like getting hit with like a forty pound trout. Just like, uh, bam. That's a large trout, that's forty a pounds. Pretty that's a, big that's a big trout. trout. Getting a trout to the face is not fun. But that is, that is sounds pretty cool. So can you also run it on the website? Like if you did it from the beginning, could you have it be like your main website as well? Uh so or is that would that be awkward? Yeah, you can't do that. Okay. Um, but it uh, I actually started from the web version and like the the very first version was just the website that I copied and pasted into PhoneGap, and that actually worked. It was clunky because oh. it was meant for you know a desktop, so you can't actually do PhoneGap for you know PC, but uh, you can take your website and port it over, and it uh, it's close to the same. So it gets two thumbs up for you. Two thumbs way up, and that's free. PhoneGap's totally free, open source, and supposedly it'll even work on like Windows. Uh, Microsoft Surface tablet. But Which you are know. totally buying in hot pink. <laughs> yeah. With all the money you make from Trivapedia. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, if enough people buy Trivapedia, I will get a hot pink Surface tablet. Yay! <laughs> That'll be our cover art forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If that happens. <laughs> Maybe we'll just go to the Microsoft store and take a picture of you with it, and then it'll be our cover art. No, yeah, it'd be awesome. I think I'll do it. I'll have two. Like, two. like you know how you see, like, those People with two guns? Oh, no, no. No, where it's, like, a guy, and he's got two, like, Budweiser babes or whatever. Yeah, I'll have the two pot pink Surface tablets, yeah. Okay, we won't tell your wife about this. <laughs> uh, I don't know if she listened to the show or not, but my tool of not the bye week is... <laughs> Xbox Media Center, which is actually not called that anymore, oh, uh, really? just XBMC, oh, okay. um, because it's not just for the Xbox anymore. Ah. So this was a project that, if I recall correctly, originally started out on the original Xbox, so which is a PC, mm -hmm. just without full windows on it mm -hmm. um, and so they re-scripted it had like a program that would run and you would have to hack it and you could put this on there and it made it into what it says a media center so you could wow. you know play DVDs like a DVD player you could you know had a hard drive in the Xbox so you could put stuff on your hard drive and you could you know play mp3s and movies that way just a really flexible thing and over time it's, it's just continued to support other platforms and they did a really good job that some open source projects managed to do just amazingly well which is kind of make a completely modular platform Platform. So they're able to just have like this back end to run on the Xbox, but this whole front end like UI and media manager and rating system and all this stuff that could be platform independent. Oh, and wow. it does allow them to kind of support even more than the original Xbox. Now I think it I, I think it even runs on the Xbox 360, I'm not sure. But it run, it'll run on your PC, so you can just oh, run wow. it as like a what they call a 10-foot interface. So you know something that you can use from your couch with a remote. Um, if you have it hooked up to your computer. And I think it supports like OS X, Linux, Windows. It also, I think it'll, they have a version of run on the Apple TV. So if you uh, awesome. jailbreak your Apple TV, you can run it there. Oh, you have to jailbreak? Yeah, you do have to jailbreak because Apple doesn't actually let you run um, oh, any apps, gotcha. like a download apps on your Apple TV. I don't have an Apple TV, but I believe that's correct. Gotcha. Um, so you can jailbreak it so you can run your own apps. And then this is one of the apps. Or maybe it's like an actual boot to it as like an IO, as an operating system. Wow, you um, can even do it on the iPad. That's impressive. Oh, that's cool. So I, that's probably like actually too, maybe like same front end interface thing, right? So what happens is you can just set up 
on a NAS, a, a network area store, a network attached storage, yep. uh, or just like a PC running, or even just internet, and just have kind of that as your backend, for a source for media and data or whatever, and stream it to this XBMC client and just run stuff, play stuff. And it's cool because some of these devices are crippled, so you get an Apple TV and it's like, oh, I wish I could do a little bit more. Well, Apple TVs are pretty cheap. I think they're like $100. So, I mean, way easier to maintain and take care of it and still do what you want by installing this on there than running like a whole other PC and paying for extra power and, and all of that. Um, yeah, so totally. that's kind of cool. And or space, you know, PC yeah. takes a lot yeah, of space. Yeah, and Apple TV is very small. Or even like an Xbox 360 or an Xbox, you can buy them very, very cheap. So if you have an entertainment center and you can put one of these in there and for, you know, what does the Xbox sell for these days? Probably like $50 for a used one. Yeah, you don't totally. even care if it's probably got a broken optical drive if, you know, assuming there's another way to install the Xbox. <laughs> you just need it to do one thing, right? So like you can get it really cheap and then, you know, whatever the back end you have for your house, you can have all these different front ends and it's just a really nifty thing. So That's check totally it out. Awesome. Also, I use it as kind of like even just on my Windows PC at home instead of Windows Media Center because I have a TV tuner card um, and this doesn't support TV tuner, um, at least not that I saw. I didn't really try that hard. Um, but for just like general, like watching movies or whatever, the media center on Windows is kind of terrible. So this is much yeah, better. Yeah. And so I like this a lot. And so nice. I use it to do, to do stuff on there. So that's very useful. Um, I've been thinking about, this is off topic, but so like decking my, like, you know, uh, my space out with like all sorts of like front end TV m media players. It's actually really complicated to like not spend a lot of money and have something that my wife and, you know, one day my child and like other people that just come over or whatever, be able to use and not yeah. be like, oh, turn on this computer, turn on the TV, switch the HDMI port to this, you know, go over, do this. Like, it's really, I really want like a really nice, like, I feel like there's a market there. Somebody like had a really well thought out, customizable system to do all this. Maybe it's not yeah, possible. Totally. Maybe I'm pipe dreaming. But. Yeah, because I mean, for, for me, for example, I have the same problem where, you know, if you want to play the PlayStation, uh, you have to switch over to HDMI too, and you have to know that. That right there is hard. Then you have to like turn on the PlayStation controller, boots up the PS3, all that stuff. But then if you want to use the PC, you have to go in the coffee table, get the, <laughs> the wireless keyboard and mouse, switch over to PC, you know, turn on the computer, which it's a laptop and we keep it closed. So you have to like open the hit lid, you know, turn it on, close the lid again. Yeah, it's just all not, this stuff, it's not feasible. You know? Like the, the general like DVD player, PlayStation, Xbox, like that is is okay. But like if you get something, I don't know if you ever used a Roku or an Apple TV, like something that, but that did this like streaming really well and yeah. had like an integrated back end so I knew it was gonna work. Like there's other stuff like uh, Western Digital makes something that's a front end. I think Roku even has some stuff. I mean, these people have things that'll stream on the front end and Xbox Media Center is closed, but then I still have to get a compatible back end and make sure the right codecs are installed or the right conversion or run like something and make sure it stays updated and on it. It's just, I wish there was like some really nice, low cost, like uh, maybe you should write one on your uh, Raspberry Pi that you will get oh, eventually yeah. one day. Did, did somebody, oh, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine at work, he uh, signed up for the Raspberry Pi around the same time I did, maybe a month before. And uh, he got an email saying that they were gonna ship it to him in like a month and a half. Oh, so it's hoping, gonna be forever for you. Yeah, so it's minimum month and a half. So I'm thinking like in three months I'll have one. Based on um, when I signed up and when he's... Of course, it could be a million people in between. So us. by programming through it on episode 100. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, so it'll be I'll good. have MAME running on the Raspberry Pi. Yay! By the time uh, we run out of programming languages. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like recently that it's one of those... Pro what is the thing? Like if you had... T talking about growth and like you try to count something, like it would grow faster than you could count it. So yeah. I feel like programming languages that way... We there's a programming released more frequently than we do the show. Yeah. And so like we totally. even if we keep going like we'll never it yeah. they grow faster than we do. And it's like even if the like you know if we were omnipotent and the number like the number let's say wouldn't grow or wouldn't grow very slowly. But as people write in and tell us about new languages and things like our awareness that number is growing much faster. Yeah, that's true. And I don't think yeah that we're never seeming to catch up. It's, so, it's which really is bad. great for the show. Oh, so. well, I mean great. <laughs> yeah, it's bad for uh, our queue, but it's um, amazing for the show. <laughs> so, all right. Well, on to this week's topic. So this isn't a language. No, it's not. It's 
Uh, it's actually sort of, I guess, a process. A concept? Uh, yeah. It's yeah, so build like automation. Yeah. So what is the one thing everybody thinks of? When I, when I heard this topic, I thought of one thing. Make, make. and make files. Yeah. Make files. I, are, is it just me? I, I dread make files. Oh, man. Somebody starts talking about make files, and it's I just, just want to so stick painful. my fingers in my ear and go, la, 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 la. <laughs> yeah, it's so bad. You know, if, if I get an error in, like, you know how most programs, if, if those are, yeah, they're done, like, Linux stuff, they'll say, oh, you know, to, to install this, just download the, the zip file and then run, you know, dot slash configure and then make, make and then install. make install. Yeah. If any of those three fail, I give up. Yeah. I, I just don't <laughs> Raise bother. my hand. That's me. <laughs> yeah. That's me. It could be, like, it could be so specific. It could say, oh, make file line 31. This if should really be an end if. And like I won't even. It's like forget it. Nope. I'm not touching. Not this touching thing. it. <laughs> yeah. Or if it's like I hate, sometimes you install a package and it's like you don't do dot slash configure. It's like something else. Like oh, you have to go in and enter this oh, or yeah. enter your platform type. Like no, don't, auto I'm done. make. I'm done. Oh, I'm done. Man, like, so brutal. Uh, so, but it is a very hard topic. Yeah. Like, I mean, building complex. We talk about many module, many people working on a common programming source base, and like, how do you get all of that to build down into one? You know, let's call it a deliverable, an end item, a thing that you're yeah. going to use and run. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, it's it's completely vital. As painful as it is, there's just if you think about it, you know, you can do like many build commands in a single command. Like, let's say you had three C++ files and you wanted to compile all of them into one object. You can do the dash C and then the file name is dash O, right? But like eventually you're gonna run into something where you have to do like many different things. You have to follow some kind of recipe. Or like you need to build it for two systems. Yeah. You know? exactly. Or like you need to build it with uh, you know this library for math or possibly this library for math. Yep. Or you have two parts of it. You have the math library and then you have the graphics library and then maybe you have a third part like the it's like combinatorial <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and it's like the executable you know needs a math library and just yeah i mean you need to have some way of like controlling the build process so and making sure so i've learned this the hard way making sure everybody on the team is building it the same way yeah so totally. if you just let people like for instance like let's stick in the c plus plus world for a second it's so like just use gcc to make it right like oh i'm just going to do this from the command line like well, what optimization level did you use if we're tracking yeah. down a timing problem or, you know, any other set of, you know, p potential flags or worst of all, like different people have different things in their like, you know, bash RC script or wherever yeah. and like stuff is happening that they're not exactly aware of or don't remember and like tracking down that happened to me and a colleague of mine. I was getting an error and um, the nobody else on the team was getting the error and it was only me and I had submitted a fix, like a bug fix because I thought it was a bug. And it turned out they all had something additional in their like setup script that oh, I didn't have. Yeah. And it turned out, uh, I don't know if it was a bug or not. Like it just, we got into a debate about like, well, which way is the right way? But for sure, everybody needs to do it the same way. Yep. Yeah, totally. So we should probably go through the history. This is a, this has a pretty like crazy mixed up history why it's such a crazy mess right now <laughs> it's sort of it's grown very organically and i'm sure there's like even stuff we're not even gonna talk about like history is just kind of like a travel through time as opposed to a complete history because i'm yeah. sure there's like there was jason's make configuration script right that you probably yep. had that was personal and like that may have been the very first one or yep. you know so this is like a more of like a arrow through time <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so and I don't even know which one of these two came first, but the first ones that I know of are, are make, which everyone, you know, if everyone here is typed make, um, is almost certainly using BSD make, which is, that's the one that everyone kind of uh, uh, is, should be familiar with. Then there's also gmake, uh, which is GNU make. And basically those two essentially do the same thing, which is they, you know, they parse the make file and then they turn the make file into a bunch of commands. And so we'll get into sort of make files and what those are and things like that later. But um, they sort of process the make file directly. So someone goes in by hand and writes the make file. And then these guys go through and, you know, as sort of interpreters, uh, just as if you had you know, writ written a Lua file or a Python file, these guys go through line by line 
and parse the make files. So, so the make files program. there is kind of like the programming language of make files. Yeah, or yeah, make exactly. Is a yeah, so in, in, in studying for this, it really brought to me like how much I, what is the right term, conflate? Like I put together the idea of make and GCC. So GCC is an amazing yeah. set of software. It's so powerful. And in my mind, make and like GCC are, are kind of linked. They're kind of one and the same. But they're really not. No, totally different. Yeah. Yeah, so you can use make to do all sorts of other things if you really wanted to. In fact, yeah. I, I might be like Turing complete. I'm not really sure, but uh, it's, yeah, it's close. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can definitely do all sorts of crazy stuff with it for sure. Um, then there's so then you know people quickly realize that make files were kind of brutal to write. They get very long, and very yeah, complicated. And they the hard part about it is that there's so many sort of variables that you're defining, and then you're also like defining all of these rules. So a variable might be like the flags for this program are dash o three dash p dash g. That's a no. variable. That's that's not. Those aren't the right ones. What? I'm just, I'm just kidding. You're compiling you totally it wrong. Totally got me. Totally got. Me. Uh, we're actually recording the podcast like in the same room, and so like, like Patrick could see the fear in my face. And I was like, <laughs> Oh no, Dennis. So, anyways, so, so that's a variable, and then you also have, uh, you know, actual rules. So, for example, you know, uh, whenever you have to do something, whenever you have a rule called that ends in .cpp, uh, call GCC you know, the rule name and then the rule name dot O or something like that. And so make files have both of these sort of intertwined. You could put a rule here, you could put a variable there. So these a lot of these make file code generators, like auto make and q make and c make, um, they try to sort of have this like data definition kind of thing. Like C make, for example, uses a key value pairs for defining all of your variables. And so that makes it very easy to sort of visualize and see, and they even have groupings of variables. So you can see like, these are my compiler flag variables. These are my path, include path variables. These are et cetera. And then CMake also has the CMake list.txt file, which has the rules. But by kind of separating those two, it sort of makes it easier to understand. Yeah, so CMake also has like a GUI. So yeah, if you want to, right. I mean, you don't have to, but it, it also makes it easier to represent. And then they make their own kind of intermediate file. Like, yep. this is like the CMake description of what you are. So, like you say, certain sorting is enforced or certain groupings are kind of taken care of. Yep. But then, and then from then, you can kind of compile, interpret, translate that CMake file into a normal make file. Right. And right. then it handles a lot of the boilerplate code, the organization, the complex branching structures you might want. And yep. Yeah, totally. So that was sort of like the second phase, you know. They got into like the auto make, C make world. That's sort of the next generation. Code writing code. Yeah, it's getting scary. Code writing code. We must go deeper. That compiles other code. <laughs> uh, so now the the more the most modern is uh, sort of this Ant Maven kind of stuff, and so. And so these are normally associated with like Java. So kind of like around yep. the time like Java was coming out because Make and GCC were kind of like kind of intermixed. And so this is an opportunity for people to kind of say, well, we're doing Java. So it's a different methodology yep. that we're going to kind of put in. And and these ones actually take it a step further. So not only do they are they sort of at a higher level as CMake and QMake and things like that, but especially in the case of Maven, it's also in the cloud. So you can say, hey, um, you know, I need the uh, like I need the pill the Python imaging library um, you know your maven file can say that and it can actually go to the cloud find a copy of the Python imaging library pull it onto your machine and build it without you having to you know distribute that with your with your code you know it's like the idea of adding that pulling it in from the internet is in the build file and so that I think is really awesome because one of the hardest things is is you know distributing your code and then realizing like oh I was using this version of free image <laughs> and now like Ubuntu 13 is on that version of free image and my make file doesn't work anymore my yeah you know. and like knowing like if you can have it pull which I, I think it's able to do like pull the latest version right yeah so I keep right. pulling the the newest version of Python yep. Engine Library. Like, it could be confusing in some sense. Like, oh, why did this not work? Or why did it stop working? Or, or like, all these things. But on the other hand, like, it means that if your end user goes and grabs the latest stuff, you know it'll work. Yep. And then if something does break, you can go ahead and just fix it. Yep. And if it doesn't or you don't want to because there's some drastic change, you could always lock it in a set version. And yep. at least it's explicit. Like, 
it's not that it was whatever Python imaging library I pulled on June the second of the year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's just like uh, you know version one point six point three point four point two point one a. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, and this keeps you from running into like shared library hell or DLL hell, as Windows people call it, where you know you were you were using this version of free image and you included it in your make file. And so even though this person has a higher version which would have worked, now they have to build your version too for your app. Oh, yeah. that that points out another pet peeve of mine is like people have like version numbers and they'll have like an upper bound on the version number. Mm -hmm. And even though there's no reason, it's just that was the highest version that was around when yeah. they are. And you have a higher version and like you have to go in and edit to like allow your higher version because you know it'll work and you can't find the older version. And, yes, yeah, uh, brutal, man. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's cool. I, and so now also, you know, sort of in parallel with the Ant Maven stuff is you're starting to see more of the build process integrated with the IDE. Mm. So for example, if you use Eclipse, uh, if you create a new C++ project and you um, you drag a bunch of files into some folders there, Eclipse is smart enough to sort of look at the files, you know, index the files, come up with the dependencies and yeah. do all that good stuff. So. Yeah, making things easier. Yeah, totally. Although, totally. although I guess then when things go wrong, maybe it'll be like assembly. Like nobody will know what the underlying, like yeah. how to get stuff built actually works. Yeah, I've had things bomb in Eclipse and it's just been brutal. I mean, it comes down to like you have to remove files and add them back. Or uh -huh. like remove a file, t you know, keep removing files until it works and then... Oh, yeah. So yeah, it gets ugly. But or when it's like tied in as well with source control and then like stuff gets oh, all like messed no. up. They can get really <laughs> bad really fast. That's so bad sometimes. Yeah, so, so that's the history. As you can tell, it's still kind of a hard thing to deal with, but it's something that as software engineers and coders, you know, we have to deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, you so really got to know. to be aware of it. Yeah. And you already kind of talked about, but I mean, like, if we didn't have this, it would be horrible. I yeah, mean, that's right. This is better than the alternative. And there really are a lot of features that these things bring. So yeah. you kind of hit, like, dependency. So, like, this, you know, there's the, the concept that if I depend on module B, which depends on module C, I depend on module C. Well, you say, no, you don't. You just depend on module B. Yeah, yeah, but module B, like there's this, you have to kind of walk this graph. Yep. And it's not just like one to one to one. I mean, they can get, you know, to many, to many. And so you could be expanding. Like I depend on one project, which depends on five projects, which depends on each of those, depend on two or three more. You get this expansion that can get really big, really, really fast. Yeah, and totally. so something has to kind of go through and understand like, oh, okay, I need to build this first and this second and this third and kind of yeah. come up with that whole structure. Yeah, I mean, imagine like if you did this yourself, Let's say you um, just had a .sh, like some shell script that just built all of your files. Um, and then you had, let's say, like a graphics engine and a music engine, uh, and then your game engine with the executable in it, right? So you started off with like, it built the graphics, and it built the music, then it built the game. But then for whatever reason, all of a sudden, you know, you decided that, oh, I want there to be like I want the graphics engine to depend on the music for some reason. Like if a certain music's playing, I want to play an animation and instead of writing an API, I'm just going to have like the graphics code import the music. Bad code. coder. That terrible code. Don't ever do that. Bad coder. <laughs> but now you have to like rearrange your shell script. And you know, in this case with just three things, you would just move it down, but you can imagine this getting way way out of hand. And also your shell script doesn't self-document. Like the fact that things are in a certain order, like you know in your head that the graphics engine has to be built first, but the shell script just has three lines. I mean, it doesn't, inside it, unless you write your own documentation there, it doesn't encode that one thing depends on the other. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. So, and even just having a list of what all the things you depend on, like you said, so if you're gonna email somebody else at your source code or post it up to a source control somewhere, yep. you know, then that way you can kind of say like, hey, this is all the other stuff you need as well. And some languages have, kind of batteries included features that make that easier than others. So other thing you talked about a little is, is the kind of cross compilation or even just like for 64 bit versus 32 bit or, oh, yeah, you know, like I need painful. big Indian versus little Indian, like yeah. all of these things, like, you know, you may support all of those features in your program, but you got to pass the appropriate flags to you, to the yep. compiler, to possibly the operating system, like, you know, all these different things. And you, sure, you can do that, right? Like you could write that file, but it's much nicer to have a tool to help you write those things and to keep them organized. Yeah, and in like in the same way as most languages are written in themselves, you know, we've, we've talked about that every now and then where, you know, Python comes batteries included. So a lot of the things in Python, like the entire standard library is written in Python. So 
in the same way, a lot of uh, you know, a lot of make files reference things that are also written in make that just kind of come standard. So for example, going back to your example of Big Indian versus Little Indian, they've already done the grunt work of calling the sort of crazy kernel level libraries to figure out if your machine is Big Indian without you manually specifying it. And you just have to say like, is Big Indian or something. Mm. And some, you know, the make file, you know, program writers have dealt with that problem for you. So well, that's a good point because depending yeah. on what machine you're compiling it on, yep. not just compiling it for. Yep. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you might you might say like, I just want to compile it for this machine, whatever it is. And so, you know, if you don't know what OS call to make to learn all of the intrinsic properties of this machine, uh, you know, the makefile guys, they do and they've done all that, yeah. So uh, yeah, another big part of makefiles are um, using conditional logic. So for example, uh, FFmpeg is a, is a popular like MPEG encoding decoding library. And they're constantly under fire from like the, was it RIAA? Oh, okay. And, yeah, yeah. and uh, um, other like organizations that are against sort of re-encoding of music and things like that. Um, so what FFmpeg has done is they've <clears throat> structured their make file in such a way where you can pass a flag called uh, I think it's enable non-free, dash dash enable non-free. And if you pass that flag, they'll give you all of the codecs like MPEG-4, which are sort of in dispute and are not sort of like, like are under patents and things like that. Uh. Um, if you want to be on the safe side, let's say you're a big um, corporation and you're worried about getting sued and things like that, you can not put in that enable non-free flag in and the make file. Code. And then that stuff will be out of the code. And so. This is really important for FFmpeg because they want to make sure that you know, not only can you not use this, but it's literally you know not in your code. Like the the code's not in your object, so you can't get in trouble. Yeah, no, that's pretty good. So we already kind of I think we we spoiled most of the strengths talking about features. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one one in here that is good is that you're talking about is also you know even if you could write shell scripts for all this stuff because you were an awesome programmer, um, which you are. And, uh, Likewise. Uh, no, that's not true. You're wearing a Nintendo <laughs> controller t-shirt, so um, I, I have no, my argument is invalid. <laughs> uh, so um, parallelizing and distributing. I mean, this is something that if yeah, you were going to do on your own, totally. it would be like you'd have to write your own library. I mean, it would just be crazy. Yeah. But here the make files can handle like once they know the dependency graph and they yep. walk this, they can say this build can go on on a different machine than this build because it's not needed until this step. And so it can kind of chop and slice and dice it you know, eight ways between here and there and say like, this is our plan. This is how we're going to compile everything. And so use things like dist CC, yep. distributed GCC, like these kinds of things. And, or even just, you know, you have multiple cores handling all this is very complicated and can be quite complicated and make files can really help you with that. Yeah, I told you like, if you've ever done the whole like configure, make, make, install stuff, um, you know, unless somebody is has written their make file wrong, but assuming that someone's put the dependencies where they should have and everything, um, you can replace that make with make space dash j and then the number of cores. Oh, that's obvious. Dash j for yeah, Jason for Jobs. Oh, for oh. Jason. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So you can have like eight Jasons like in hamster cages, just like running away in parallel. I want a Jason in my computer to compile my code for me. Oh, that'd be pretty awesome. That'd be a horrible a job. on my computer, too. Oh, okay. I don't know why. I, I, that, that sounded really vain. <laughs> <laughs> I would like a Jason inside of every computer. Actually, I just want the Argonauts. Jason could stay out, but I need an Argonaut in every computer. Um, isn't that like a one and an Argonaut zeros? Like the biggest number ever. So You, you lost me. <laughs> I don't know. I think you went over my head. I'm, I'm, I'm searching so, the Google now. Yes, an Argonaut is one followed by an Argonaut zeros. I'm totally making that up. So you could do make dash J eight, for example, and uh, it'll automatically know sort of like what depends on what, and it'll use all eight of your cores. Wikipedia to, says uh, Argonaut is an ancient Greek civilization. <laughs> and I want eight of them. <laughs> oh, there is a sailor in Greek mythology, Jason and the Argonauts. Yes, indeed, indeed. Okay, so. All right, sorry, continue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, so you could totally make your uh, make your makes blaze super fast. <laughs> make, make, make. You can make your make makes. Um, yeah, and, and also, as Patrick was alluding to, there's disk CC, which is, that's actually kind of a little tricky to set up. 
So, um, you know, it, unless you're doing a ton of building, you know, I wouldn't go that route. Um, or you have a server you, farm. Yeah, yeah, but if you're, if you, uh, <laughs> or you want to use EC2 for that, if you have lots of money. Um, but yeah, uh, you could totally install DisCC. It's like a um, wrapper around GCC. And uh, let's say you had like four computers in the house. You could put DiscCD, which is the DiscCC daemon, on all four of those computers. And then uh, when you did uh, make, um, I think it's like, I forgot the flag, but there's a way you can put into make where it'll actually farm out your make, which is pretty uh. awesome. And you also won't have to heat your house. <laughs> That's true, yeah. You can just heat the house with induction from uh, your, your processors that are just on fire. Or, like you said, if you're rich and you have a lot of money, instead of starting up this on uh, EC2, you could just send the money to us and Jason will compile it for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There will be eight Jasons. <laughs> oh, right. so, so weaknesses, we already talked a little about it. Sometimes just because of the job, the nature of the job, make files can get incredibly complex. Yeah, just so complex. It just yeah, it can get ridiculous. So also, I mean, it's another layer between you and the compiler, and so that can kind of obscure things, which is great. I mean, you want to have an abstraction, but at the same time, it can kind of hide errors from you. Yep, totally. Yeah, I can't count the number of times where I've gotten errors, and just I try to compile some open source app, and I get an error, and you know, the error might say like something really crazy, like oh, can't find like some file with like 10 different you know sets of ellipses in front because make has like stepped through all these directories and then like now is referring to a file relative to somewhere else that I don't even mm. know of you know so yeah it can definitely make things really hard to debug so and because of all that you end up with the one guy who you know who's really good at this yeah exactly. and he's the only one and he helps you put some awesome code in your make file that you do not understand and nobody else has either and then eventually that person leaves forgets whatever and you end up with what i call in the code black magic yeah that's the, those lines of the code that you have in a lot of historic legacy programs which nobody quite knows why they're there or what they do but don't take them out or it will break yeah yeah i actually saw something in a make file where it said like error one is okay here and then it returned two. <laughs> and I'm like, should I be worried about this? <laughs> the answer is probably yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, there's a, fortunately, there's a lot of tools to sort of help you navigate the painful experience that is the make file process. Yep. Um, you know, one of them is uh, AutoMake. AutoMake's very popular. Um, I actually do. Do you know anything about AutoMake? Like I've nope. used it a lot. Yeah, same. Never here. used it. <laughs> oh really? Uh, I've I've gone in and like because sometimes it tells you type AutoMake and uh, AutoMake. Okay. It's such a complicated mess, but AutoMake creates the configure that then you have to call to create the oh, make man. file oh, man. that you have to call make on to make. Yeah, it's crazy. I need to go take pain medicine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somehow AutoMake is is better than writing make files. I don't get it. But one that I have used a ton and I swear by it, I think it's great, is CMake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned most of the, the good things about CMake with separating the variables and all that. Um, but CMake's a great one. Um, I've used a little bit of QMake uh, for doing like QT apps. Um, oh, okay. All right. That's where I've seen it before. Yeah, yeah. And I think NMake is the one that uh, Microsoft Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I've used that. So pretty much star make. Like, yeah, insert yeah. any <laughs> character here, make. Yeah, exactly. You need a J make. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It should be the next one. <laughs> Argo make. So, um, yeah, yeah. And as we mentioned, Ant and Maven are tools. There's also pre make, um, which is kind of interesting because it uses Lua, which we talked about in oh. the last episode. Yeah. So you actually write um, Lua code that generates the make files. And I've used pre-make, it's decent. I still prefer CMake, but, uh, but pre-make Playing good favorites too. over here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one of the things where they're kind of like, you know, sticking with our typical outline, I guess, we're trying to come up with some, some uses. We talked about, I mean, obviously to help build your file. Right? That's the main use of a build system. Yep. But some things, you know, to kind of give you guys nuggets of inspiration, you know, things to think about, things you may never heard about. And you may say, oh, this is old hat, Jason and Patrick, and you're like, oh, that's great. But some of the, the newfangled things that young whippersnappers are using <laughs> are, you know, like continuous integration, right? So, you know, the idea that, yeah, you might be able to type GCC, blah, 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 really fast. But, uh, you know, one thing is that you might not type it every time you make a code change or every time you push a change even. Mm -hmm. And so more and more it's important uh, idea, idea of, you know, building your system continuously with the code that's checked into the re repository, like what is it, 
You know, is it successfully billed? Will it run the unit tests? Yep. Does it have unit tests? Yes is the right answer there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, does it have system tests? Does it have end-to-end -end tests? Does it have, you know, just all these kinds of tests? Um, yeah, so, so to put what Patrick's saying, like, more explicitly, like, if you, let's say you have, like, Subversion or Git or something like that, you can actually write something on your server side, I think it's called a hook, a Git or Subversion hook, where every time somebody checks in code, it runs the make file, and then it runs make test, and then it runs make system test. This is perfect. Like I just that. say a bunch of words, and then you like executive summarize it for me. <laughs> I do need you in my computer. <laughs> like I can write an email, and then you can write TLDR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> But so, yeah, I actually only recently found out about continuous integration stuff because uh, that's something I hadn't been privy to until recently. Uh, it uh. is pretty awesome. I actually, I got the uh, the email nobody wants to get, which is uh, the, uh, oh, you broke the build. You, you broke know. the continuous integration. Yeah, like you submitted code that now has causes everyone else to... Uh, but that doesn't happen if you have perfect unit tests and perfect peer review. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which everybody has. Of course. Nobody ever makes mistakes. No. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. I don't. <laughs> That's a lie. I can't remember last time. I do I regularly. I also have terrible memory. <laughs> the worst is I got an email because I did this, and I got an email f not from my own team for breaking the build, but from another team who depended on our team. Oh, those and are the so worst. Yeah. They, then they're like, hey, Hey, what are you doing? And they, like, we are a little bit more sheltered in how we do stuff, but they have, like, you know, they have to meet certain requirements, certain demands. Like, when something breaks, it's, like, a big deal for them. Yeah. And, like, I broke it. Nice. And so Yeah, I broke something, and just in a terrible twist of fate or coincidence, um, it happened to be the hour that they were cutting, like, their release for the month. Oh. And I just happened to break their stuff, like, you know, only minutes before. Oh, and tisk, so, tisk, tisk. yeah, I actually got a phone call. Like they they called my cell phone. Oh wow, it was, it was not pretty. Uh, um, <laughs> another, you know, the alternative oh, to that is like, you know, they cut the release and then it's and broken then it, yeah, to yeah. the customer. So yeah, still, right. make files incredibly useful for that kind of stuff. So and also, um, you know, for source distribution or package management systems, yeah. you know, so like things that are going to hold for people on all sorts of platforms and versions of the OS and all this and for them to be able to download from a common area. Yeah. So like, you know, the Ubuntu software project, you go in there and say, I want more apps and, you know, here, or I guess applications, here's my software, I'm going to download it and, you know, so they can get compiled for your system. Sometimes they're pre-built, but sometimes you can have the people build it themselves so that it can be specific for their platform and highly optimized. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, that's all I got for uh, for this week. The, the fun topic that everybody loves of uh, <laughs> yeah. build automation, but it is important, and you know, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, many people who watch the show are, are still, uh, you know, in college um, or in high school, and so I think that it's hard. One to, person like, was in elementary. Really? No, I don't know. Oh, okay, I made that up. <laughs> I was impressed. So they, uh, you know, it's hard to sort of appreciate this, you know, build system and build automation because a lot of the times you're working solo. But you quickly find when you work with a team, things as what Patrick mentioned were, you know, I had something recently where I was using a different version of Java than somebody else. Uh -huh. And so like my code worked like on my machine, didn't work on theirs. And so, you know, these kind of problems are just multiplied when you use make files, you know? Mm. Like, uh, for and, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah, and I was gonna say too, like the earlier you start learning to use these tools, even if you are a solo team, even if it's overhead you don't really need, but like, especially if you are not yet working in the industry of software, yep. Software industry. Wow, I said that poorly. Uh, I think it works. As long as if you know if you're not yet there, and you say, well, "Why would I? Why do I care? I don't work on a big team. I work by myself." Yeah, yeah. But if you learn these things now, when you go to work, like it's gonna be people are gonna think you're that much more genius when you show up. Yep. You know, like you get through the interview that you show up and like, oh, we have this thing people don't know about. It's called continuous integration. You're like, oh, no, I use that on my. You know, like you'll know about it. even if it's not the same form, even if it's not, you'll. I mean, the ideas totally. will be there, and, and you'll be that much more productive that much sooner. And one thing I've noticed from looking at like old code is even if you're working by yourself, if you go back and look at code you wrote, say, two years ago, it might as well have been written by a different person. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, think of yourself as like a collaboration with your with other yourself, selves over your time. Your future self. Yeah, exactly. And so you're know, writing make files is a way to sort of immortalize your code nice. and hopefully keep it so that it builds you know, a couple of years from now. Well, sorry for the slight delay in the episode. We had some Skype issues uh, last weekend, so uh, we're recording this again. But hopefully this is a great episode. Hopefully you guys will enjoy. Thank yeah. you again for all the reviews still coming in and the emails we get. And yeah, like totally. hearing from you guys. Yeah, yeah. If you guys have any questions about 
you know, programming throwdown or anything, don't hesitate to throw a comment on our G+. Throw it down. Throw it down. Talk, tell us what your favorite uh, build automation tool is. Yeah, yeah. So just languages. J-make. <laughs> Brown, brownie points for all the J-makes. I'm going to look that up. <laughs> no, it might actually be a real thing. It probably is. It might it be is a rap a real artist. Thing. Of course it is. Oh, it really, Java programmers compiling all large, large projects. projects. All right. Okay. So I think that's all we got. So uh, that's a wrap. Yeah, have a good one, guys. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.